the leadership of the Jewish community is is, is beneath contempt when it comes to uh, things like fairness and fighting against McCarthyism. Hello, I'm Jonathan Tobin, editor-in-chief of the Jewish News Syndicate, JNS.org, and you're listening to Top Story, a weekly podcast where I analyze the most important stories happening in Jewish news around the world. Each week, I will break down politics, foreign policy, and culture to provide insights into what is going on behind the headlines. Hello, and welcome to Top Story. Last week, Americans were shocked by the news of another attack on an American synagogue. Thankfully, the outcome was not the tragedy that the attacks on synagogues in Pittsburgh in 2018 and in Poway, California in 2019, and no one was killed in Colleyville, Texas, except for the terrorists who took the rabbi and members of Congregation Beth Israel hostage. The 11-hour ordeal ended when Malik Faisal Akram, a 44-year-old British national, was shot dead by an FBI SWAT team that entered the synagogue in a suburb of Fort Worth. But once we express our gratitude at this outcome, is it permissible to discuss what or who might have helped inspire the terrorist assault on a house of worship? Perhaps not. Since the attacker was a Muslim seeking to free a notorious Islamist terrorist who was widely considered either a heroine or a victim of Islamophobic persecution by some in the Muslim community, the instincts of many Americans, including Jews, is to downplay the specifics. There is a desire on the part of many Jews to emphasize, above all, the need to avoid any finger-pointing, dot-connecting, or comments about the incident, that might impinge on our desire for good relations and continued dialogue with American Muslims or the groups that purport to represent them. And if that means simply moving on from the incident as quickly as possible, then all the better. To the extent that this means that no one should blame innocent Muslims who have nothing to do with this, then that is entirely correct. Of course we shouldn't do that. However, as we have seen over the past two decades since 9-11, Every time an Islamist is behind an act of terrorism, the desire to avoid fueling a backlash against Muslims is often so great that it helps create a counter-narrative in which the main takeaway is always to speak of the main danger being condoning Islamophobia rather than Islamist terrorism or those who support or rationalize it. That, of course, was very different from the reaction to past synagogue attacks where those responsible were identified as right-wing extremists. Under those circumstances, many in the Jewish community were quick to jump to conclusions about what might have somehow inspired the incidents, no matter how tenuous the connection. The anti-Semitic murderer who attacked a Pittsburgh synagogue in 2018 condemned former President Donald Trump in his online ravings for being a friend of Israel and the Jews. Yet many in the organized Jewish world were ready to connect Trump to the atrocity because they considered the tone of his rhetoric or his attacks on political foes or opposition to illegal immigration to be responsible for motivating the killer who, among other reasons, hated liberal Jews for supporting immigrants. Many even protested Trump's visit to the synagogue to show solidarity with the Jewish community to which he has ties of both blood and shared love of the Jewish state. Despite that, it is an article of faith among many political liberals that Trump is an anti-Semite or enabler of anti-Semites. It seems that the rule of whoever I don't like is Hitler always prevails nowadays. That immediate and enthusiastic search for a villain in those incidents, other than the actual perpetrator, was wrong, and it should not be repeated after the Kalevul attack. We don't know a lot about the man who attacked the Texas synagogue, and it may be that he was, as his family has apparently claimed, mentally ill, something that may be true of others who have committed acts of violence. Still, it is not inappropriate to speak of those who actually do support anti-Semitism and who have popularized a cause that was apparently part of the motivation for the attack in Colleyville. Akram's demand was for the release of Afia Siddiqui, The object of his failed effort is a Pakistani-born terrorist holding degrees from both the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and Brandeis University, and who is currently serving an 86-year sentence in a federal facility in Fort Worth 
for attempting to murder U.S. servicemen in Afghanistan and conspiring to attack sites in New York with a dirty bomb. Siddiqui is notorious not just for her crimes, but for engaging in a series of anti-Semitic outbursts during her trial in 2010 and for expressing various conspiracy theories about Jews and Israel. Despite this, she is considered a victim and an object of sympathy by those like the Council of American Islamic Relations that considers her a victim of the Islamophobia unleashed across America by the 9-11 attacks. CARE, which condemned the incident at the synagogue, has been outspoken in advocating for Siddiqui's freedom, having organized various events promoting her cause as recently as this past November, including one featuring political activist Linder Sarsour, another notorious anti-Semite. Indeed, Siddiqui's lawyer, Marwa El Biali, is president of the Dallas-Fort Worth chapter of CARE. The group has also recently been in the news for its effort to shut down funding of those organizations that monitor extremism, hatred, and anti-Semitism in the Arab and Muslim world because they supposedly support Islamophobia. Only days before the attack in Texas, CARE issued a report seeking to pressure secular and Jewish philanthropies to defund CAMERA, an important group which effectively monitors anti-Israel bias in the media and mobilizes readers and listeners to hold outlets accountable for their mistakes and slanted stories. The Middle East Forum, which educates Americans about the Middle East and Islamism with expert scholarship. The Foundation for Defense of Democracies, a think tank that is a voice of sanity on national security issues like the Iranian nuclear threat. Memory, which performs the indispensable task of translating into English what is published and broadcast in the Arab and Muslim worlds. The Investigative Project on Terrorism, which has brought to light extremism and connections to terror in the Muslim community. And the Clarion Project, which monitors online extremism and whose advisory board is partially composed of leading moderate Muslims. CARE's intent is to generate enough worry or outrage among Jewish groups institutional bureaucrats, and funders to create a surge of divestment from the causes that the group is labeling Islamophobic. And given the desire of so many to signal that they are free of any taint of racism or prejudice, the chances that this will have some sort of impact on them are not to be discounted. It's hardly a surprise that a group like CARE, which traces its origins as a political front for the Holy Land Foundation in the 1990s, a group that was exposed by the FBI as seeking to raise funds for Hamas terrorists in the United States, would be opposed to these organizations. Nor is it surprising that it is itself guilty of spreading and condoning anti-Semitism. One of CARE's leaders, Zahra Bilou, gave a speech last month in which she urged Muslims to shun all Jews except those who support the anti-Semitic BDS movement and condemned all other Jews as being guilty of conspiring against and supporting crimes against Muslims. Despite its pose as a civil rights group, CARE neither condemned her remarks nor repudiated her. That's why those who take CARE as protestations, or those of other such groups about opposition to anti-Semitism, or their horror at attacks on synagogues at face value, are being duped. The same is true for their attempt to separate their claims that Siddiqui is an innocent who is framed by the government in the course of an Islamophobic war on terrorism from what happened at the synagogue. To state this is not to condone any rhetoric that seeks to blame Muslims in general for the act of an individual. But whatever drove Akram to seek his own death and that of others in order to free a Jew-hating terrorist, it is not inappropriate to note that the rising tide of anti-Semitism around the globe is largely fueled by those like CARE, who seek to demonize Israel and the Jews. When that leads to violence, whether in the Middle East, Europe, or on the streets of American cities, or at a synagogue where people are gathered for Sabbath worship, it is far from out of bounds to call out those who have rationalized or promoted ideological attacks on Jews. Instead of focusing on that, all too many are attempting to claim including even the FBI in its initial statement after the conclusion of the incident, that what happened at Colleyville has nothing to do with the Jews or anti-Semitism. 
that refusal to confront the truth about such attacks is the problem. We should be grateful that Kalevil was not the tragedy that the attacks in Pittsburgh and Poway turned out to be. But neither the survival of the intended victims nor the wish to avoid conflict with those who claim to represent Muslims should cause us to avert our eyes from the truth about groups that seek to mainstream anti-Semitism, even while pretending to oppose it. And now, to our interview for the week. Can Americans speak up about their political views anymore without losing friends who disagree with them? Can Jews who care about Israel be vocal about their love for the Jewish state without running afoul of political fashion and finding themselves ostracized or canceled? Is advocacy against BDS and the way anti-Semites use anti-Zionism and hatred for Israel also compatible with being a political liberal or even being a critic of Israel's government? And is an accusation of personal misconduct, no matter how amorphous or disconnected from provable facts, enough to justify canceling an individual? Each of those are weighty and difficult dilemmas to contemplate. But as much as some people might have to face one of them, there is one prominent person who is currently dealing with all of them. Alan Dershowitz is no stranger to controversy, but he has probably never been more embattled than he is today seemingly under siege for the sin of defending former President Donald Trump in his impeachment trial, someone whom most of his friends despise, and also despised by many for his ardent advocacy for Israel at a time when the left wing of the Democratic Party, with which he has been affiliated his entire life, is turning on Israel. Just as important, he has been accused by a woman who is considered one of Jeffrey Epstein's victims of misconduct and despite the fact that the charge remains both unproven and credibly disputed, is widely accepted as true by many in the media and elsewhere. So we're especially glad to have him with us today on Top Story to discuss all of this as well as his opinions on key issues. Alan Dershowitz is an emeritus professor of law at Harvard University Law School, where he taught for 50 years. The famous legal cases that he was part of, including the trials of Klaus von Bülow, O.J. Simpson, Mike Tyson, Jeffrey Epstein, and former President Trump, are too numerous to list. The same is true for the many books he has written, including Reversal of Fortune, Chutzpah, The Case for Israel, The Case Against Impeaching Trump, Defending Israel, The Story of My Relationship with My Most Challenging Client, the Case Against the New Censorship, Protecting Free Speech from Big Tech, Progressives, and Universities, just to name a few. Alan Dershowitz, welcome to Top Story. Well, thank you so much. I'm a big fan of your writing, so I'm thrilled to be on with you. Well, thank you. That's very flattering. I really appreciate it. And we're really happy to have you with us. Um, Professor Dershowitz, um, we're going to get to a lot of things, or at least as much as we can in the time we have allotted. But I want to start with the story connected to you, with which is now in the news more than any other, and let's get it out of the way. Um, you were at one point one of Jeffrey Epstein's lawyers. You were yourself accused by one of the women who claimed to be one of the victims of his sexual misconduct. Um, but though you have put forward a, a considerable amount of evidence to prove that her claims are untrue, you are right now considered by some um, tainted by the association and indeed canceled by some, even in the Jewish community, because of it. Tell us first why you believe this is both unfair and illustrative of a disturbing trend in which accusations are considered enough to destroy people regardless of their truth. Well, I lived through McCarthyism, and this is McCarthyism. Temple Emanuel in New York is engaged in McCarthyism. Uh, the 92nd Street Y is engaged in McCarthyism. Both have told me they don't believe the stories. They know they're not true. Anybody who knows me knows that I have been faithful to my wife. I've had sex with one woman since the day I met Jeffrey Epstein. My wife, the woman who's accused me, has a long history of lying about Al Gore and Tipa Gore and George Mitchell and Ehud Barak and uh, Leslie Wexner and you know, name it. Uh, but the leaders of the Jewish community in the Y and 
the uh, Temple Emmanuel are, are scared. They're frightened. Uh, they don't want to be accused of uh, victim shaming, just like the people during the McCarthy period didn't want to be accused of being uh, fellow travelers or com simps. Uh, uh, the leadership of the Jewish community has behaved abysmally in this uh, regard. And, uh, and uh, you know, I saw the other night a program on 60 Minutes uh, which showed that uh, Anne Frank had been turned in, probably, by a leader of the Jewish community. And I have to tell you, this didn't surprise me. After the way in which Temple Emanuel and the 92nd Street Y and other Jewish leaders have tried to throw me under the bus, it didn't surprise me at all. The leadership of the Jewish community is, is, is beneath contempt when it comes to uh, things like fairness and fighting against McCarthyism. They're only interested in their own um, security. Uh, for example, in the case of the Temple Emanuel, the chairman of the board is the one who said, I could never come back to Temple Emanuel. You know, I was the most popular speaker. We had 1,600 people coming and listening to trials. I did biblical trials, put Moses on trial and David on trial and Abraham on trial. But the chairman of the board said, no, 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 no more Dershowitz. The chairman of the board made his fortune by running an advertising company, which advertised some of the worst and most dangerous products in the world. And he is standing there and telling me about uh, my, my virtues. I have defended the Jewish community. I have defended Israel. I have never, never done anything unethical or wrong. Defending Jeffrey Epstein was the right thing to do. Uh, Abraham defended the sinners of Saddam. Uh, John Adams defended the people who were accused of the Boston Massacre. And I'm going to continue to defend the most unpopular, the most hated, the most despised people. I'm going to continue to defend Israel on college campuses when they are the most despised country on many college campuses. And I will stand up to the bigots, uh, the bigots at Temple Emanuel, the bigots at the 92nd Street Y, uh, the bigots in other places who want to introduce McCarthyism into the Jewish community. I will not stand silently by and allow that to happen. Mm. Now, this is, I guess, over and above other controversial cases because Me Too seems to have changed the rules about presumptions of innocence. Um, well, you don't need a presumption of innocence here. A presumption yeah. of innocence operates when the government accuses you of something. Mm. When there's been an investigation when a grand jury has charged you. In this case, no government agency, no investigator has accused me of anything. In fact, I have gone to the FBI. I've gone to the U.S. Attorney's Office. I wrote an op-ed for the Wall Street Journal saying, FBI, please investigate me. This is one woman, one woman with a long history, a long history of trafficking 14-year-olds, a long history of lying about some of those prominent people. You don't need a presumption of innocence. There's no evidence. There's nothing to presume or be against. It's just the cowardice, the absolute craven cowardice of the leadership of the Jewish community that has not come to my uh, defense. They called on me all the time. I would get calls two o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning. There's a person in trouble somewhere in Yemen. Come help. I do. Uh, there's a person in trouble somewhere in Texas. Come help. I do. And now I have an issue. And where are they? They're hiding under their their, their seats. And uh, it's, it's, it's a terrible, terrible uh, commentary on, on the rabbis, on the leaders, uh, on Rabbi uh, Josh Davidson of Temple Emanuel, who knows better, who told me directly that he knows that I've been falsely accused and that he can't stand up to his board of directors. He said if he had the decision to make, he would, of course, invite me. But he doesn't make those decisions. The board of directors makes those uh, decisions. No, no, no. A strong rabbi stands up to the board of directors and tells them, Sedek, Sedek, Tirdof. The Bible demands that you do justice, not that you cower in the face of injustice. Can you tell us where that case currently stands in this legal dispute with, uh, with your accuser? Well, look, I could easily have done what uh, George Mitchell did or what Bill Richardson did or what Ed Barak did, I could have remained silent uh, and the case would have gone away. I didn't want to do that. I wanted to expose the perjury of my accuser and the complicity of her lawyers, particularly uh, David Boyce, who told me on tape, I have them recorded, 
she's wrong, simply wrong. You know, you're innocent. Uh, she made a mistake. She's wrong. I want to expose that. And so um, she's suing me for defamation. I'm suing her for defamation. David Boyce is suing me for defamation. I'm suing him for defamation. I never had a case in my life till I was 75 years old. I never sued anybody. I was never sued by anybody. And for the last few years, particularly since the Me Too movement has started, I've been in court. That's been my life. Uh, you know, I'm still trying to defend as many people as I can in the Jewish community. I just helped five people get out of uh, Iraq uh, the other day. I'm working on a Yemen case. I'm continuing. I'm not going to allow this false accusation to stand in the way of my life's mission, which is to help Jewish people, help the Jewish state, help the Jewish religion. I'm going to continue to do that. But my voice has been stifled. And as a result of the 92nd Street Y canceling me and Temple Emanuel canceling me, now colleges and universities have an excuse. Oh, if the Jewish community won't listen to Alan Dershowitz, why should we invite him to come to Columbia, to come to Cornell, to come to Colgate, to come to Penn, to come to Stanford, to come to the University of Chicago? Previous to this, I had spoken at more colleges and universities around the world than any professor. Since this, I have not been invited to defend Israel in a single college or university. And it's the fault of Temple Emanuel and the fault of the 92nd Street Y that my voice on behalf of Israel has been silenced. Hmm. Well, if the Epstein case wasn't enough to, in a sense, cancel you, um, there are some who might argue that it was happening already because of your per participation in Trump's defense against charges of impeachment, impeachment, and because you were quite vocal, despite your opposition to him politically, um, to the effort to derail his administration because of the Russian collusion charges or the Ukraine charges. Um, as you just stated a few minutes ago, we have a long tradition in this country dating back to John Adams' defense of the British soldiers accused of murder in the Boston Massacre, of respecting the obligation of lawyers to defend all defendants, even unpopular ones. And you've defended some very unpopular people prior to participating in Trump's defense, yet those who accepted your work for O.J. Simpson or Mike Tyson don't seem to be willing to def tolerate uh, defending Trump. Um, you have yourself spoken about how former friends have shunned you because of it, including an incident with uh, TV personality Larry David. Uh, what do you think this says about American society today that so many of us are no longer comfortable being friends with people who disagree with us politically or even take up the defense of someone we don't like? Well, it really is a terrible reflection on where we are as a country. Uh, Larry David had no problem coming to me when his daughter couldn't get into any college and he asked me to open the door to possibly referring her to a college, which she got into. Uh, he was perfectly happy to come to me for advice on his show. But um, when I defended uh, President Trump against an unconstitutional impeachment, and when I put my arm around uh, Secretary of State Pompeo, with whom I had worked on the, on the Abraham Accords and on uh, recognition of Jerusalem and on the uh, recognition of the Golan Heights, he said I was disgusting and he would never talk to me again. And he screamed at me and yelled at me. Uh, this is a man who I've been friends with for uh, many years. And um, uh, it's a symptom of a larger problem in America. I have relatives um, who I've been very close to who wouldn't speak to me uh, or who attacked me and insulted me for defending uh, President Trump. Uh, as you say, I voted against him twice. I voted for Hillary Clinton with enthusiasm and voted for, for Joe Biden. And, um, and uh, yet, of course, I defended Bill Clinton against impeachment. I was part of a consultation group that helped defend him. I defended Senator Alan Cranston, a Democrat. I've defended probably seven or eight Democrats, Governor Edwards of um, Louisiana, and nobody complained about that. But when I, as a Democrat, I defended the Constitution against an unconstitutional impeachment, I became persona non grata on, on, on Martha's Vineyard. Uh, but it's interesting that no one on Martha's Vineyard, no one turned against me on the Epstein matter, because they all know me, and they know I don't hug, I don't touch. They know I would never do anything like that. They limited their attack on me to, to uh, Trump. Um, um, and so there was a real 
a real separation, but the two together, obviously, um, became uh, a source of, um, of um, opposition to me and, and cancellation. I don't cancel easily. Uh, I don't go down easily. Uh, you know, people say to me, oh, my God, why are you writing for uh, Breitbart? Why are you appearing on Newsmax? Because CNN won't have me. Uh, and I'm not going to be silenced. I'm going to go to whoever will allow me to express my views. I've expressed my views loudly and openly and clearly since I'm 13 years old. And I'm going to continue to uh, do it until as long as the good Lord gives me the strength to to fight back against injustice. Yeah, I, I think you're right about that. It's a symptom of something larger in society. Um where does this, where does, where do you, as somebody who's been observing, uh, participating in our public square on, on important issues for, you know, such a long time, um, that we're in this moment where, you know, Americans are, it's like we have a bifurcated political culture. People read, listen, watch different media. They seem to be in different realities. They've lost, uh, at least in my observation, the willingness to credit political opponents with good motives, let alone, you know, not being evil. Where does this lead us? I mean, it, obviously nothing good, but where do you, how do you see this coming out? Because it just seems to be getting worse. It worries me. Um, I'm a student of uh, history and in the 1920s and 30s, all through Europe, um, the countries of Europe were divided. You were either communist or fascist. Uh, the centrist parties were quickly disappearing, uh, not in Weimar, Germany, but shortly thereafter, from probably around 29 on, and in France and in Spain and even in England, um, uh, to a lesser degree, um, democracy thrives at the center. Uh, you and I have disagreements. You're more conservative than I am. I'm more liberal than you are, but we can talk to each other. Uh, and we do talk to each other. I read your writings with tremendous admiration. Um, sometimes I make marginal notes and I, I disagree, uh, but uh, you inform me and I hope I inform you. Uh, the idea that uh, there are two sides and, and never the twain shall meet. Look, I'm a Red Sox fan and I don't like the New York Yankees, but when Jeter came to bat, I would stand up and, and applaud him. Uh, you know, when Rivera pitched, I, I gave him a standing ovation. I understood the virtue of the Yankees, but you know what's happened is we've turned our country into the worst aspect of, of sports. You have to pick the Yankees or the Red Sox. You have to pick the Knicks, you know, or the Celtics. You can't show any virtue on the other side. Well, America is not a sporting event, and you know there's no such thing as virtual on one side. Uh, from the day I first became interested in politics as a 13 or 14 year old. I always saw some virtue in Dwight Eisenhower, even though I voted for Stevenson. I always saw virtue on the other side. I was never just uh, the perfect Scotsman. You know, uh, you have to accept everything that the Democrats say. You have to reject everything the Republicans say. That's just not the way America thrives. We thrive at the center. We thrive with dialogue. I was very close to William Buckley. Uh, the arch conservative. I was on his show all the time. I was his favorite liberal. He was my favorite conservative. We'd fight like children on the show, and then we'd go out and have a drink afterward. And 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 he would say, you know, I really do agree with this, and I disagree with that. That's the way America uh, uh, should work. Um, you know, it was like my mother growing up. My mother growing up would say, you know, the 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 uh, ultra orthodox, the Hasidim, they're too too religious. The reform. They're not religious enough. We're just right. Uh, and I think a lot of Americans think that. They think they're just right. And anybody on the other side deserves to be condemned and attacked and not spoken to and uh, canceled. And that's not good for America. Yeah, I think I think you're right. And interestingly, there's another point on which we disagree, which is baseball. But thank you for applauding Jeter and Rivera. Um, <laughs> let's turn to Israel. Um, you have been among the Jewish state's most ardent defenders, even while specifying that at times you disagree with some of its leaders and their policies. 
support for Israel in the Democratic Party, and especially among political liberals, people on the left, seems to be un- in decline because of the rise of intersectionality. Seems? It's in deep decline. It's yes. Seems. It's in deep decline. Yeah. What do you think explains that trend, as well as the willingness of some on the, uh, on the part of some in the Democratic Party to support or at least rationalize the actions of the BDS movement? Well, first of all, I think Israel is strong, and therefore it doesn't rank high on the list of priorities for many American Jews. Many American Jews care more about the climate, care more gay rights, care more about indigenous rights, care more about uh, police brutality. And when you ask them, Israel, well, you know, it's seventh, eighth, tenth uh, on the list. That's number one. Number two, um, being a college student today, uh, you're not going to be successful on a college campus if you're perceived as a Zionist, if you're perceived as somebody who supports Israel. You're going to be thought of as narrow-minded, as right-wing. And um, I remember when I wrote my book, The Case for Israel, one of the reasons I wrote it is because a kid came to see me, a sophomore at Harvard College, and he said, I need you to give me tshuva for repentance during the Aseric Yemei Tshuva, the 10 days of repentance. I said, I don't even know you. How can I give you? He said, I, I feel terrible. I'm very knowledgeable about Israel. I went to Ramaz. By the way, Ramaz has canceled me also. The Ramaz school was supposed to allow me to teach their students how to combat anti-Semitism on college campuses. And then the headmaster called and said, no, we can't have you because of the accusation, even though we know it's false. So he said, I went to Camp Ramaz. I went to school at Ramaz. I went to Camp Ramah and uh, I went to Israel for a year. I know all about Israel, but I'm silent in class. I don't speak up uh, in the bull sessions. I said, why not? He said, because I- I'll never get a date. Uh, I'll never be popular if I'm perceived of as pro-Israel. And that's when I decided to write my book, The Case for Israel, which became a bestseller on college campuses. Um, but um, today it's much worse. Uh, today, if you want to be a success on college campuses, you can't be perceived as pro-Israel. If you're pro-Israel, you won't be elected to the student government. If you are, you'll be thrown off the student government. Uh, you will be graded down uh, by faculty members at the University of Michigan. Uh, a professor refused to write a recommendation for a student because she wanted to go and spend her year in Israel. And um, uh, it's become very, very difficult to be pro-Israel on college campuses today. And and many, many, uh, many Jews just don't seem to care uh, about it. Uh, You know, I remember in the run-up to the 67 war and then to the Yom Kippur war, there was tremendous support for Israel because people thought Israel was in danger. Today, people don't see the danger. The danger is greater today than it was in 1967 or 1973, because in those years, we didn't have Iran with nuclear ambitions, and, um, and we didn't have the BDS movement, we didn't have the United Nations. Uh, that became a little later in 75. Um, and, 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 but it's not perceived that way. And, you know, Israel is controversial. Benjamin Netanyahu, in my mind, a great leader, um, but uh, is very controversial because he's outspoken and doesn't uh, easily suffer fools. And uh, if you support Netanyahu, as I have done, again, legally, would I have voted for him in Israel? I never indicate who I would vote for, but my general inclinations would not be to support Likud if I were an Israeli. I'm much more to the left. But my political views are irrelevant to who I defend and uh, who I who I stand up for legally. So, um, you know, I think there's a problem today on campus and there's a problem within the Democratic Party. Uh, The idea that Nancy Pelosi would pose uh, in a picture for the Rolling Stone with one of the biggest bigots and anti-Semites in modern American history is shocking to me. She would never pose with a member of the Ku Klux Klan. She would never pose with a member of any other group that opposed so strongly uh, a religious group the way Ilana Mayer does Israel. And so there is a problem. It's a problem of tolerance within the Democratic Party. You know, I threatened to quit the Democratic Party when they were going to elect um, uh, Keith Ellison to be the chairman of the party. I said I could not be 
a member of a party that had as its chairman a supporter of Farrakhan. Fortunately, he was defeated. Um, he's now the attorney general and doing terrible things in Minnesota. But uh, uh, the problem is the Democrats tolerate hard left anti-Semitism and bigotry. Republicans, some Republicans also have tolerated hard right um, bigotry. And I think both parties have to marginalize their extremists and have to move more to the center. And I, I, I hope that we'll see that. Right now, the conflict among Democrats about Israel seems to be, in part at least, generational, with the octogenarian leadership of the party pitted against younger members of the squad, as you alluded to with Ilhan Omar. Um, is this something that's going to get worse um, as, as the generations uh, pass? And uh, whether or not is that that is the case, how do friends of Israel, um, you know, win back the Democratic Party? It's going to get much worse. You know, my friends constantly say to me, why don't you attack the right wing as much as you attack the left wing? Well, two reasons. First, I'm a person of the left. And as a person of the left, you attack the left. Um, and people on the right should be attacking the extremism on the right. Um, I will continue to attack the left more than the right. Uh, for that reason and for another reason, even more important. The left is the future. The right is the past. Right-wing bigotry represents the past. Left-wing bigotry is centered on colleges and universities, which is our, our future. It's the younger people. And so I predict that in 20 years, uh, we're going to have people running for president on the Democratic Party side or Senate and other mainstream positions who are very, very anti um, uh, Israel. Uh, AOC is a perfect example uh, of that. Uh, and um, uh, I think we're in for a real problem over the next uh, uh, 20 or so years. You know, prophecy ended with the destruction of the temple. Uh, so says the Talmud. And Yogi Berra put it even more aptly. Uh, uh, prophecy is difficult, especially about the future. And so one doesn't really know what it will be like in 10 years or 20 years or 30 years. But um, I think the, 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 the hallmarks all point in the wrong direction. Mm. Um, speaking of dangerous trends, one of the most important conflicts over ideas right now seems to be one that pits those who advocate for equity as opposed to equality and for throwing away the vision of a colorblind society in favor of one that seems to focus almost exclusively right. on race. Um, while this is dismissed by some as irrelevant, how important do you believe the battle about critical race theory and everything connected with it is for the future of this country? And is that set of beliefs that seems to have so much influence over academia, the media, and increasingly in the public square is one that is compatible with the traditional ideas about a liberal society or with the fight against anti-Semitism? I agree completely. And that's why I wrote a book called The Case for Colorblind Equality in an age of identity politics. And it starts, my book starts with two episodes in my life. One, my attendance at Martin Luther King's August 1973 speech uh, on the mall. I was a law clerk in the Supreme Court uh, at the time and where he talked about his four children, hopefully um, being judged by the quality of their character rather than the color of their skin. And then uh, just about a year later, having dinner with, with Malcolm X at Harvard uh, where he presented a completely different image. Um, the word equity is a fake word. It's a fake word. It's a made-up word. It's designed to start with EQU so that you think of equality, and yet it's exactly unequal. It's designed to create inequality, to justify inequality. So I would never use the word um, equity. Uh, equity is, is misused. What we're talking about instead of equality is racial bias and racial preferences. Uh, it's gotten so extreme that even uh, today, some medical care is based on race. I can I understand medical care being based on need, on underprivilege, but a billionaire African-American man who is the CEO of a company shouldn't get ahead of some poor person from uh, uh, an area of the country that, that's, that's riddled with poverty in medical care. It shouldn't be race. It should be based on, on other factors. The same thing is true of, of college and university admissions. Uh, the children of wealthy, privileged black shouldn't be given advantage over the privileged, over the unprivileged uh, people of different 
of different backgrounds. So uh, I, I don't like race as a criteria for anything. And, uh, and you can't use race uh, in the name of equity or equality. Um, uh, you know, race has been a terrible factor in America uh, through segregation and Jim Crow, the detention of 110,000 Japanese Americans during the Second World War based exclusively on, on their race, we need to move toward a colorblind society. And we need to move toward a society where people are judged based on the quality of their character. But today at UCLA, if you use the word meritocracy, you have committed a microaggression. You cannot advocate meritocracy. Well, everybody advocates meritocracy when they're going in for surgery or when they're flying an airplane through a storm. You want the most qualified surgeon, the most qualified pilot. But when you're dealing with something that you don't care about, which doesn't affect you, then you're prepared to compromise meritocracy for some other values. And maybe they should be compromised for some other values when it comes to, uh, you know, who is on a TV show or who is in advertisements. I'm perfectly happy uh, not having meritocracy there, or even when you vote for people for, for Congress. It's not a meritocratic thing. You do want some uh, racial and religious and other uh, identifications, perhaps. But there are certainly going to be some jobs where, where it's absolutely essential. Uh, meritocracy must be the rule, and colorblindness should be the way we achieve meritocracy. We want to have more people of color who deserve, based on their hard work and on their, in, uh, on their character, to be in positions of authority. That's the goal. And we're moving away from that goal with this phony notion of uh, equity and, um, and, and um, this other uh, uh, program of critical race theory. The one thing about critical race theory is it's uncritical. You can't criticize racial theory. It's uncritical race theory. Uh, if you raise any criticism of the established approach to racial theories, again, you're canceled. Yeah. Let me draw upon your expertise um, in the law to sort of explain for us or at least give your, your take on one of the, the top political issues right now, which is the question of voting rights and the claim, um, certainly by President Biden, that various laws that have been passed uh, by Republican legislatures are Jim Crow point two. Um, he uh, posed the question about, you know, the the cases, you know, the, the, the legislation currently up before Congress um, proposed by Democrats as just a case of you're with the Confederacy or you're with us. Um, how do you see this issue? Do you think that democracy is really in danger if these laws aren't passed? And, you know, where, where does this stand in your view? Well, you have to look at them piece by piece. For example, I am strongly in favor of requiring identification for voting just like I'm strongly in favor of requiring identification that you have a vaccine for getting into buildings or getting on airplanes. I think it's a mistake not to require it for getting on airplanes. So it's so interesting. The right wants identification for voting, but they don't want it for vaccines. The left wants it for vaccines, but they don't want it for voting. I want it for both. Um, the goal is not to uh, no longer require identification for voting. It's to make it easier to get identification. We should be putting our energy into making it very easy for any eligible voter to get identification and maybe even push harder in certain communities to make it clear that you can get ID. It's the easiest thing in the world today to get ID. You have to, you have, to have identification to get into a building today to get almost anything in life. So why shouldn't you have to have it to vote. So, uh, you know, I'm on the conservative side of that issue when it comes to I identification. I'm not when it comes to gerrymandering and uh, 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 creating districts which disempower certain groups and empower other groups. I think we need more uh, fairness. So I, I don't agree that we should look at uh, voting rights as a whole. We should look at each particular individual thing and assess it on its own merits. We have two goals. One's more important than the other. The first goal is to make sure that every qualified voter, every voter who's entitled to vote gets to the poll. That's more important than the other. 
and the other is to avoid any kind of fraud. Now, avoiding fraud is important. It's just not a big deal. It's not a big problem in America today. The bigger problem is getting people to the polls. Now, getting people to the polls is also largely a responsibility of leaders. Um, you have to make it easier for people to get to the polls. You have to make it desirable for people to get to the polls. You don't have to pass laws necessarily to do that. There shouldn't be barriers to the voting. But if some people vote less frequently than other people, then the issue is not one of law. It's an issue of, of, of social and, and political. And so we have to look at the issue of voting in a, in a, we have to break it down to its component parts and not use language like Jim Crow or Confederacy. That doesn't help. Yeah. Um, you've had a unique career as a law professor, lawyer, leading voice on important issues, both legal and political. But in today's environment with American society locked into, as, as we've already alluded to, a tribal political culture war, do you think it would be even possible for one of your successors at Harvard or any law school at an elite university to take up the cases of unpopular defendants and causes? Uh, is that something even imaginable nowadays uh, for someone in that kind of a position? Well, we saw what happened when my friend, one of the greatest lawyers in America today, Ron Sullivan, uh, who was the first African-American dean of a college at Harvard, for one month consulted on the case of Harvey Weinstein. He was fired from his job and it sent a clear message. I mean, the message is you want to succeed in America, be like Larry Tribe. He's a hypocrite. He's a phony. He'll uh, support any cause that gets him popularity. Uh, the Democrats are always right. He'll change his mind. He'll have one rule when Bill Clinton's president, another rule when, um, when uh, Donald Trump is president. But he's successful. Students love him. Faculty loves him because he's always on the right side of every politically correct issue. Whereas Ron Sullivan, who's a great hero, is prepared to be in court to defend. He's a liberal Democrat, but he's in court today defending some of the people who have been overcharged on the January 6th events in, in the Capitol. But uh, I'm sure people are going to be picketing his classes and protesting and, uh, you know, he'll he'll probably never be a dean of any law school, although he'd be ideal to be a dean or a president of the university. So, you know, the message has been sent quite clearly in academia. If you want to succeed, be a hypocrite. If you want to be a principled person, you're not going to succeed. My new book, which is my 50th, which is coming out in a couple of months, is called The Price of Principle. And it tells the story of how incredibly difficult it is to stand up for principle in today's world instead of just going with the flow and following the majority and doing whatever the Democrats want, doing whatever academia supports. Principles are very, very much in disrepute today. Yeah. Is, is this something new or is this, you know, obviously, um, you know, uh, nowadays, every, you know, anything that happened the day before yesterday is ancient history to a lot of people. This is not the first time in, in our history of our culture where it became important very difficult to speak out, yet somehow, I guess partly because of the magnification of the way the media currently works and social media, um, you, know, lynch, you know, mobs can be formed very easily online, uh, more easily than in person. Um, but this isn't the first time in our history things like this have happened, is it? it? No, but it's the worst. It's much worse than McCarthyism. Let me explain why. McCarthyism, it was the bad guys versus the good guys. And many in academia and many in the media didn't have the courage of their convictions, but there were some who did. Um, today, it's much, much more difficult because the suppression of free speech, the denial of due process, the cancellation is coming from good guys. It's coming from our children, our nephews, our nieces, our friends. They're in favor of the environment as I am. They're in favor of gay rights as I am. They're in favor of gun control, as I am. They're on the right side of everything. It's just they don't understand what Louis Brandeis said 100 years ago. The greatest danger to liberty lurks in people of zeal with good intentions, but without understanding. It's so much harder to fight the good people who are doing bad things than the bad people. I I, I'm reminded of the Pogo cartoon when I was growing up. We have seen the enemy and he is us. 
And that's why it's so difficult for me, because the people who hate me are people whose views I share, for the most part. They just do not understand means and ends. They don't understand due process. They don't care about free speech. It's free speech for me, but not for thee. It's due process for me, but not for thee. And that's why it's so much of a harder fight. And that's why we have to fight back even more, even more aggressively than we did against McCarthyism. McCarthyism was a function of the past. It was the reflection of a dying part of society. The new McCarthyism is the future. And that's why it's so frightening. Yeah, I think that's true. Um, we've touched in how prolific you are as an author. Um, you've just told us a little bit about your next writing project, which was my next question. But tell us about your process as a writer. Um, how do you write so many books? How, how is it that, um, you know, what, what is your process and, and, you know, how do you go about it? Do you write at a certain part of the day or, you know, do you, you know, do you do it in sort of sp- Spurgeon, you know, uh, uh, you know, you certain periods. Uh, what, what's your process? I'll give you an example of something I'm writing today. So about three o'clock in the morning, I got up and I said to myself, something's bothering me about what happened at that synagogue in Texas. And it's not what's bothering most people. What's bothering me is why did they have to kill the hostage taker? That's not a question that's going to get me a lot of popularity. My understanding is that the hostages had already escaped and the hostage taker was alone with a pistol in a synagogue with no hostages and no bargaining power. And only after the hostages escaped did the FBI go in and kill him. Why did they have to kill him? So it kept me up. I'm a civil libertarian. I know we have a reckoning that's going on now about the use of force against minorities, but nobody is asking this question because we're so thrilled that the rabbi threw a chair at this guy and managed to get out. It's great and we're applauding. But we have to pause and ask the question, did he have to be killed? So at three o'clock in the morning, I thought about it and I have always a notebook next to my bed. I wrote down a little thing so I don't forget it. And I woke up in the morning and I started writing. And, um, no particular time of the day, the idea struck me that I want to write a piece. Did he have to be killed? Will I get it published? I don't know if anybody will want to publish that piece. Everybody is so thrilled that the hostages escaped and that uh, uh, no damage was done to them. But that's typical. And uh, so I write every single day, different times of the day. I don't have a specific time or place. It just, the idea has to strike me. And, um, For example, I'm writing another article now called The Private State. Um, It came upon me that many of the things that I grew up with, you grew up with, that the state performed the function and now privatized. When I was growing up, the mail was delivered by the post office. Money was printed by the Treasury Department. Uh, Voters voting uh, elections were tabulated by uh, public officials. Um, um, uh, Wars were fought by only the army. Um, uh, today everything's changed. Today we have Federal Express and we have private companies counting votes and we have cryptocurrency. So I thought it's worth speculating about that. So I've written an article about that. Um, and so I write every day when ideas strike me and, uh, uh, you know, I'm 83 years old, so I don't have to do a lot of research because I've lived a lot of these things and I write from my experience and my passion and so every day I write uh, two or three thousand words. Wow. Well, that's, um, that's that's my advice to younger writers. Writers write. Just keep doing it. Um, and thanks for weighing in. I think that that's great advice. Uh, Remember, everything you publish is a first draft. Don't aim for perfection. Aim to get a good piece of writing. But if you aim for perfection, you'll never get it done. The first five years of my academic life, it's an interesting story. I was so highly regarded when I finished law school. You know, I was first in my class. I was editor in chief of the journal. I was a Supreme Court law clerk. Every law school in the country competed for me. Everybody thought I was the smartest guy out there. And of course, I said, I can't write anything because I'm not that smart. Uh, People think I'm a lot smarter than I really am. And if I start writing things, they're going to finally realize, you know, I'm not that smart. 
So for about five years, I didn't really write very much because I had to write the perfect piece. Otherwise, I wasn't going to write it. And then I said to myself, nah, 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 come on. Uh, I'm smart enough. Uh, I'll write. If they don't like it, they'll argue with it. I'll write another piece. So uh, I've come to believe that you don't have to seek perfection in everything you write. The perfect is the enemy of the good. I'm satisfied with the good. Yeah, that, that's good. That's good advice for a journalist, too. You know, there's no such thing, as I like to say, there's no such thing as writer's block in journalism. Anyway. Per- sure, I'll settle for good. I'll settle with most journalists, not you, but most journalists. I'll settle for low mediocrity. We're not even there. <laughs> not even there. You know, when I was in high school, I was a bum. I was a bad student. I was a good athlete. I was a, I played basketball on my high school team. I was funny, but I was a terrible student. And, and I went to yeshiva. And my favorite grade, I got a grade once, Bain or Ni minus, which in Hebrew means mediocrity minus. I didn't even achieve mediocrity. I had something to work for. And ultimately, I did make mediocrity in high school. And I never got a B in my life. I went from being a straight C student in high school to a straight A college and law school student. So my mother always said, get B's, get B's. A, you'll be a teacher. C, it's a Shonda. Get B's. So I never got a B. <laughs> okay. Well, we learned something interesting about you from that. Uh, Professor Dershowitz, I want to thank you so much for your time, your insights, your perspective. We also want to thank our audience, whether you're listening to us on Spotify or any of the other podcast platforms or watching us on the JNS YouTube channel or on JBS TV. Please like and or subscribe to Top Story and give us good reviews. And please let us know where you listen or watch the show and what you think about it. We'll see you next week.